Welcome back. You know, in our culture, when one of the common questions we ask when we meet someone is, what do you do? One of the first questions we ask someone, what do you do? Maybe after you get to know their name and you ask them, how are you? But the other question is, what do you do? And some way, somehow, we, we pigeonhole people, we value them based on what they do. As a result, we're inclined to try to do and take careers and jobs and responsibility on what gives us that self-esteem. And we get dragged into roles and responsibilities and careers that are not necessarily a good fit for our natural and God-given talents because we thrive on what we do. Or, or quite frankly, we talk about all that we do, the various responsibilities we have, all the things that we keep engaged with to keep us busy because we feel that the more we do, the more we are valued in the eyes of people. And in the process, we become human doers, not human beings. Friend, what are the things that hold you back? What are, what are the myths that hold you back from playing to your strength? The objective of this coming, or one of the objectives of this coming short video, is to help you identify the myth that hold you back from playing to your strength. Take a moment and watch it with us. In the last sessions, we talked about the formula or the science behind your strength. We also talked about the fact that your talents are a gift from God. We talked about the fact that you start with talents, you build on them through the knowledge you gain, the skills you develop, and the experiences of life, which are the laboratory where you gain wisdom. We call this the school of life, the school of life. This is how your talents grow. But you know, unfortunately, in the school of life, we also confront things that hold us back from playing to our strengths. Marcus Buckingham is probably the best known author and speaker on the subject of strength. He has a series of videos, he calls them Trombone Player Wanted. And in one of them, he talks about the fact that in life, we confront myth. Myth, myth is, a, is something we believe in that is not true. We have myths that hold us back from playing to our strength. And if we can confront this, this myth with the truth, maybe we have a greater opportunity to play to your strength. So let me share with you three myths. And I also would like to share with you the truth that you can use to counteract this myth and you can live more victoriously as you live your strength and as you play to your strength. The first myth is that as you grow, you change. As you grow, you change. Well, I'm sorry, my friend, this is a myth. It's not true. The truth is, as you grow, you become more and more of who you really are. <laughs> Can I share with you an example to illustrate this? And it's a, it's a bit of a personal example, and quite frankly, I, I, I'm a bit embarrassed talking about it, but I'll share it with you because I think it's a reflection of how that this is not true. And as you grow, you become more of who you are. For the past 41 years, my wife has been working on me, trying to change me. She's been trying to change me in one small part of my life, which has been a kind of aggravating for her. And I'm a mature adult, and I really love my wife, and I like to please her, and I really would like to change, but I have not been able to. It's just one small little personal traits and thing that really bothers her. Can I tell you what it is? Well, I don't close doors. <laughs> Here I said it. I don't close doors. If I open a door, I don't close it. If I open a drawer, I don't close it. See, I, I'm not very good with details. And that bothers my wife because she is very particular about details. Remember, I told you that her strength is responsibility. And she doesn't see why I cannot close a door 
And friends, I have tried for 40 some years and I have not been able to change. Now, fortunately, for my wife's sake, God gave us a grandson who is a door closer. Spencer, our four-year-old child, grandchild, he just loves to close doors. You know, it was interesting. He was about a year old, and he was playing on the floor in our kitchen, and my wife gave him her measuring spoons, and that little one-year-old had them arranged by size. See, Spencer is born with attention to details, and every time he would see a door that's open, he would go and close it. He's a door closer, and I am not. And later in his life, when Spencer is 20, 30, 40, or even 70 like me, he will continue being a door closer. I just hope he doesn't marry a woman who does not close doors. That's one myth. As you grow, you become more and more of who you really are, and you notice this with Asian people a lot more. The second myth is that you grow the fastest and you gain the greatest benefit if you focus on your areas of weaknesses. If you want to really improve, fix your areas of weakness. Look at your weaknesses and try to improve them. That's a myth. The truth is that you have the greatest opportunity to achieve greater rewards and greater results if you focus on where you have natural talents and where you have natural strength. Let me give you an example. The University of Nebraska did a very interesting study. They took a group of students, group nine, grade, nine year old, grade nine students from high school, and they gave them all a speed reading text, test. Some of these students averaged about 90 words a minute. Others averaged 350 words a minute. So there, these were the two extreme sides. Some that averaged 90 words a minute and others that averaged 350 words a minute. They took these two groups together and gave them a six-week speed reading course. They all took exactly the same course together. And after the six-week course, they gave them another speed reading test. The students that had averaged 90 words a minute, they did improve to 150 words a minute. That's 60% improvement, which is good. But the students that had an average reading speed of 350 words a minute, their new average speed was 2,000 900 words a minute. That's 800% improvement. You see, that second group, folks, had a natural God-given ability that attracted them to reading fast versus the other group. You grow the fastest in the areas where you have your natural strength and natural abilities. So instead of focusing on trying to fix your weakness, focus on the things where you're really good. Invest in that, and you'll get the greatest results. The third myth is that if you want to succeed in life, if you want to be a real team player, chip in, do whatever the team needs. After all, we need well-rounded people who can roll with the punches. If you want to be a good team player, just chip in and do whatever the team needs. That's a, a myth. The truth is, if you really want to succeed in life, Focus on what you really are good at and delegate the other parts to other people so the team can be well-rounded. Let me give you an example of this. Let me give you the example of a pastor, and we'll call him Pastor Max. Pastor Max always knew he wanted to be a pastor. He went to Bible school and started his first church. People loved him, and the church grew. The church grew beyond the capacity of their building, so they bought a bigger piece of land and they built a bigger church. And people kept coming and the church kept growing. But Pastor Max felt empty, felt defeated, frustrated, unhappy, unfulfilled to the extent that he thought, maybe, maybe, maybe I made a mistake. Maybe, maybe pastorate is not my calling. And he was about to leave the ministry. Fortunately, he found an executive coach who helped him understand the concept of strength, helped him identify his God-given strength, 
encouraged him to begin to focus on his strength. He went to his church board and, and explained to them that he needs to reshape his ministry and focus his roles around his strength. With the support of his board and his pastoral staff, he began to focus on what he loved to do the most, and that's writing and teaching. He delegated all the other pastoral work, the counseling and the administration of the church, to other people who were gifted in that. Today, the church that Pastor Max leads is not numbered in the hundreds or the thousands, but in the millions around the world through his creative writing that has impacted the lives of millions around the world. You would know him as Pastor Max Locado. And he wrote about his experience in one of his books, one of his best-selling books. You see, my friend, if you want to succeed in life, focus on your God-given strength and delegate the other roles, and we're going to spend more time talking about your roles. You see, there's something else that holds us back from playing to our strength, and that's called living in the not good enough world. Living in the not good enough world. I, I lived in that world for most of my life. You see, my father died, I was only 18 months old, and as a result, I spent a lot of time with my cousins. And I was always compared to my cousins. Why can't you be like so-and-so, your cousin so-and-so? Why can't you behave like so-and-so? Why can't you be good in school like your cousin? You see, I wasn't that good in school. As a matter of fact, school to me was a punishment. And I wasn't good in school, and my cousins were much better in school than I was. I lived in that not good enough world through my childhood. And then I left and most of my career was in the sales and marketing and you know that world they they give you a quota and you make your numbers one month and the next month you're not good enough they give you a quota and you achieve it and then they raise the bar and you don't make your quota the next month and you're not good enough we live in our neighborhoods you have a car that's maybe five six eight ten years old and your neighbor gets a nice new car and all of a sudden you're not good enough your children in school come home and talk about their friends who have new clothes, new toys, and all of a sudden you feel you're not good enough. We live in the not good enough world. Your heavenly Father and my God and your God had a different paradigm because in Philippians 4, 8, we're encouraged to think of whatever things are lovely, whatever things are pure, if there be any virtue, if there is anything worthy of praise, Think of these things. My friend, take inventory of the things that are good, that are worthy of praise, things that make you feel good, that energize you. Take an inventory of the experiences of life. There are things that you like and things that you dislike, things that you love and things that you hate. The things that you love are a reflection of your natural God-given talents and abilities, and things that you struggle with, they are a reflection that this is not where you should be, and you see, as you build that inventory, as you take that inventory of your talent, your knowledge, and your skills, and you build it as an inventory, it begins to shape your God-given resume. I don't know about you, but through my 35-year career, I've changed jobs quite a few times, so I've been through a lot of interviews. And one of the first questions people ask you in an interview is, Tell me about yourself. I don't know, if you've been to a job interview, you know that question. Tell me about yourself. And, and most of us start by talking about our titles and the organizations we work for. But here's something I really would like you to learn that will change your job interviewing practice. Start by talking about your talent. One of the best ways to describe your talents is using adjectives. So here you finish a sentence by saying, I am, and you use adjectives that describe your character. You see, your character shapes how you do what you do, defines the roles you play, and then you follow your adjectives by some of the knowledge you acquired, the skills you developed, and the experiences you have gone through in life. That's how 
tell me about yourself. All right, may I ask you to please stand up and have a little stretch. Just get some oxygen in, stretch your body and blood, have a blood flowing in you there. Now for the next exercise, which I hope you will do with your partner, I'd like you to discuss having an interview, having a job interview. Uh, let's make it fun. Having a job interview with Jesus, who knows you very well, so you've got to be very honest. If Jesus were to want to hire you, you know, we are called co-laborers with Christ. <laughs> Isn't that wonderful? If God, if Jesus was having an interview with you, and he were to call you and say, tell me about yourself, tell me about yourself, what would you say? Have this discussion with your partner.